Hakka are an ethnic group inhabiting the Mekong region in Southeast Asia. Their historical origins are said to lie somewhere in Yunnan, China. A war there in the middle of the 19th century caused mass migration to the south. Today, Aka villages can be found in mountainous areas anywhere from southwest China to northern Thailand. Northern Laos is home to an estimated 80,000 Aka people. The culture of the Aka is village based. Never in their long history have the Aka been rulers of a connected territory or has there been an Aka king. Vulnerable without the resources of a state to defend themselves, they had to adapt to a minority situation. Gradually marginalized up into the mountains, they managed to maintain their traditional lifestyle, seemingly untouched by fast-paced economic and political changes in the lowland. Today the Aka generally still depend on subsistence farming for their livelihood. Rice is their number one crop and their most important staple food. In the mountainous areas of northern Laos, a lack of water makes rice terracing difficult. Upland cultivation is therefore practiced instead. The Aka people have their own language and religion. The village gate is one of the most recognizable features of any Aka settlement. The yearly ritual of gate reconstruction and the symbols attached to it are believed to form protection against threats ranging from epidemics to police raids. Most villages also have a giant swing in a place overlooking the village. The annual swing festival precedes the rice harvest and symbolizes the Aka feeling of self-reliance and freedom. Organizing sufficient clean water for the family is one of the most strenuous and time-consuming tasks in the mountains. Women are the ones in charge of fetching water. Often the next well is a long walk from the village. In northern Laos today, the traditional lifestyle of the Aka seems at risk. Over the past 20 years, more and more villages have been abandoned as their inhabitants moved to the lowlands to be closer to the district capital, Muang Sing. The Aka exodus from the mountains leaves behind ghost villages. Ban Chapakun Sai is now deserted, its houses empty. Amidst their spooky silhouettes, a calf tied to a pole indicates that at least one human soul must still be around. Yu Tong is the last inhabitant of Chapakun Sai. He stayed behind to catch a lost cow while everybody else moved. Using a calf as bait, he is constructing a trap for its mother. As soon as he has caught it, he will follow his fellow villagers to their new home in the lowland. He has many reasons for the move. Living so far away from the district capital, we don't have access to education or a market. Government services up here are also very poor.
Pressure on the Aka to give up the traditional practices of opium growing and shifting cultivation has also led them to seek alternative sources of income in the lowland. Yutong's son and his daughter-in-law stayed behind to help their father search for forgotten treasures. Of course I'm going to miss my village. But if moving closer to town means that we get access to better facilities, then it's worth it. Yotong could not catch his cow. He has lived his whole life up here. Half a century of memories connect him to his village. But the hope of a better life in the lowlands is too strong to resist. Sinuan moved down from the mountains together with her family in 1994. In their new homes, the newcomers at first were confronted with a terrible situation. When we came to Huakam village in April 1994, the villagers faced many problems, including sickness. In the first three months, 48 people died. Today, Sinuan lives in Muang Sing, but her frequent returns to Huikam village are always an occasion for a special family celebration. By local standards, the family has made it and is definitely better off. The very hard first years in the lowland seem forgotten. Sinuan proved able to contribute to the family's wealth when she was discovered by a foreign aid organization, which was at the time looking for Aka Lao translators. The people from the Lao German Rural Development Programme said, would you like to come with us? Back then I could only speak a little Lao in comparison to now. Sinuan's employment is the pride of the family. The Lao German Rural Development Programme supports a lot of activities involving Aka people in the area. Today Sinuan still works with the programme, not as a translator, but as a field worker for community development. Our life has become much better since my daughter got that job. I have experienced things which I never thought possible before. Sinuan's lifestyle today does not have much in common with traditional Aka life in the mountains but she still hopes that her people won't forget their culture in the future. I think that some of the Aka tradition should be preserved. For example, nowadays girls can wear any clothes they want, but for festivals they should still put on traditional costumes. In Aka society, Opium was always a traditional remedy for the old and sick. In the last two centuries, the greed of various colonial and lowland powers in the region led to a huge increase in the growth of poppies. Addiction spread and farmers became reliant on opium as a source of income. Among Aka people, there is a growing awareness for this problem. With the help of the Lao German program, more and more smokers are undergoing detoxification. Groups of addicts support each other in this process. 
For the camera, one of the patients reenacts the pain he felt during the first few days. <laughs> I never used opium before my parents got sick, but then I had to prepare the opium for them as medicine, and I ended up smoking myself. <laughs> it's day six of a two-week period today. The worst physical pain is already over. <laughs> At first it wasn't so bad, but after a couple of days I almost went crazy. I had a very strong urge to smoke. I was treated with herbal medicine, but still got terrible diarrhea. The detoxification is supervised by health workers. Sports activities can bring some relief to the patients. The detoxification camps are set up in the villages of the addicts. This way it is easy for the patients to keep close contact with their families. If they want, they can even go home to join them for meals. Most addicts are men, but the burden of addiction rests on the whole family. We didn't have enough food to eat, and I didn't have any money. So I went to work in order to buy opium for my husband. I will stop smoking for good now, because as an addict, I didn't even have enough money to buy clothes or food for my sons. I am very happy that my husband is giving up opium. I feel now as if our family can achieve anything. Opium is a very addictive substance, and most people here have been smoking for years. The stigma of being an addict is not a strong one in the Aka society, and the drug is still relatively easy to get. The hope is that at least 75% of the patients will give up opium for good. Two years ago, Sinuan worked in a local health center. She became caught up in a conflict over whether to follow one of the most archaic Aka rules or the requirements of modern lowland society. Here, twins were born. Before, when twins were born in an Aka village, they were regarded as ghost kids, a punishment given to the family by the gods. If you committed a really bad sin in a previous life, then in this one you'd get twins, these ghost kids. According to traditional Aka law, this meant that the babies were to be killed and the parents exiled from the village. The perception of twin birth being very bad luck is deep-rooted in Aka culture. It is therefore not easy for the parents to accept the kids. In this case, the children now live in the village with their families, but everybody still remembers the shock and the discussions of two years ago. When the nurse touched the stomach after the first baby was born, she said, oh, it feels hard. Could there be another baby? We checked and yes, there was a second child. That was a shock. The father turned his back, the grandmother left the room, and the mother started crying. Six months after the first couple of twins were born, a second couple of twins followed in the same village. After a lot of discussions and support from the Lao German program, they too were accepted by their parents. Not giving the kids away for adoption, but keeping them in the family, requires a lot of courage from the parents.
People look at the parents of twins and say, nobody has twins, only you. That's because you are a sinner. You broke the rules of the community. Maybe you have stolen something. Yes, yeah, stolen something. Today, Sinawan comes to visit the families of the twins and accompanies them to the health center for a medical checkup of their children. Sinawan understands how important it is for the self esteem of the Aka people to feel that their traditions are respected. But there is also a consensus among the more educated Aka that rules like the killing of twins must be abolished if the Aka culture is to be accepted as independent and valuable within Lao society. The twins' parents are torn. On the one hand, they have come to love their unusual kids for what they are. On the other, they get looks from fellow villagers who still believe that having twins means that in truth, you must have committed some terrible sin. As there is virtually no industry in the Muangsing area, the only means of acquiring a fortune is to engage in large-scale cultivation of cash crops. Landowners grow sugarcane and sell it to Chinese buyers. In 1982, Mr. P. Uh, was among the first Aka to move down from the mountains. Today he owns vast plantations and is probably the richest Aka in the whole district. Here in the lowland, my life is quite comfortable. We can produce sugar cane, raise cattle, and we have enough rice. Mr. Piyu was also the first Aka person to obtain a motorbike license in the district. Rumors have it that as he is illiterate, he was not entitled to take the test. But as he was the first one to try, the district authority granted him the license anyway. <laughs> In the mountains, there was no access to a road, and for the kids, it was very hard to go to school. So I decided to move to the lowland to practice sedentary farming. Mr. Piyu clearly enjoys the freedom that his business instincts earned him. Buying groceries at Muang Sing Market whenever he wants is just one of them. People say farming in the lowland is easy. We have enough rice and access to the markets, and on my motorbike, I can go anywhere I want. Mr. P. Ye represents the first generation of resettled Aka. At the time when he moved to the lowlands, the density of population was still very low and land for farming was easily available. With his lifestyle, his values have also changed. Now, if somebody says this and that has been caused by ghosts, I don't believe it. 
It's just talk. There has been a lot of change in this village. Of the numerous Aka rules and traditions, there are only four which he considers worth keeping. The village gate, the swing, the cemetery and the well. Other than that, he has found new idols to worship. When my kids come back from boarding school in Udomsai, they can decide if they want to follow the Aka tradition or not. That's a decision I cannot make for them. Nam Keo Noi School in Muang Sing. It is a boarding school like this that Pi Ye's kids attend. The lessons are taught in Lao language. Si Hom is 15 years old. For her, and for most of the Aka students here, learning the country's official language is the first and most challenging task. Like her classmate Bun Hom, she has very strong reasons for aiming at a better education than her parents received. Today, Aka people are very poor and they also smoke opium. When they become addicts, they can't hope to do well in lowland society. There are many more lowlanders than Aka working in white collar jobs. Next door, there's a physics lesson. Meidu comes from the same village as Bunhom and Sihom. She's been made class representative, which has earned her considerable respect among her classmates. The three girls live in the school's dorms. In the public kitchen, everybody cooks their lunch together. In the future, I want to become a teacher and help the Aka people to get a better education. It's very important for the Aka to learn Lao because it's the official language, but the grammar is very hard. My father is dead, but school is not expensive, so my mother can support me. And I also get a small salary because I am the class representative. Although all three enjoy going to school here, they also miss their families. The village is far away and the ride is expensive. They cannot afford to go home more than once a month. Green is the colour that draws people down from their traditional homes in the mountains to the lowland valleys. The green of lush paddy fields, which can bring their owners up to four tonnes of high quality rice per hectare and year. But reality today has a more greyish touch. The lowlanders have already divided up most of the area's land among themselves. Ado just moved to the village Ban Hom Sai 15 days ago. The village is just over one year old. 45 households share only 43 hectares of land and nobody can say yet if it's fertile. The sugarcane 
already belongs to another village. The situation here is quite bad. As newcomers, we have to do everything on our own. I really think somebody should help us to get some paddy land so we can grow rice. But getting more land will not be easy for the people of Ban Hom Sai. More people are still expected to come. Land prices are going up and long-term residents are reluctant to accept the newcomers. Already there are conflicts between old and new villages over land and water rights. Ban Hom Sai does not yet have a sufficient water supply. The people have to go to neighboring villages for drinking water and washing themselves, which leads to quarrels. The village does have a well, but the water in it is dirty. Moving to the lowland is okay if you have money. I have to try and find a way to earn some. But I have only been here for two weeks and I'm not exactly sure where to start. Ado spent the first week building his house. This is all he could carry down from his old village. Pressure on the Akka to stop opium production has led to a rapid increase of resettlement in the past two years. Without their most important cash crop, life in the mountains no longer seemed viable and Ado, like many others, saw no choice but to move to the lowland. In the mountains, I used to sell cattle and opium to buy salt and other things. But here I cannot trade opium and the cattle catch diseases. Ado was the blacksmith of his former village, a position of high esteem among the Akka. Here in the lowland, he faces fierce competition from cheap Chinese blades sold at the market in Muang Sing. For newcomers like these, selling their labour to landowners is the only means of surviving. But as more and more come, the wages tend to decrease. 10,000 keep, around one dollar, is the going rate for a day of hard work in the fields. Our situation is very bad. The money we earn here is really not a lot. I think somebody should help our families to get some land. The hope of finding paddy land will remain a dream for many. Most of the arable land has already been claimed. We came here to be paddy rice farmers, but so far have become no more than labourers. With competition for land and employment still increasing, it becomes ever harder for newcomers to find their place in the lowlands. Ban Sopi Kao can be called a remote mountain village. The walk from here to Muang Sing takes more than five hours and the village cannot be accessed by car. Village life here works the way it used to. The women do housework and collect edible things like bitter bamboo from the forest, while men go hunting or fishing. When necessary, everybody works in the fields together.
The village chief, the so-called Naiban, is well respected in the village and traditional structures seem to be in place and working. At the moment we don't think of moving, because our livelihood in the mountains is sufficient. And besides, this village has been here for many generations. I don't want to move from this area. But in the future, I don't know what will happen. The fields of Sopi Kao. With upland rice cultivation, some fruit trees and paddy rice fields in neighboring valleys, the villagers here can grow almost everything they need. In a few days, the rice planting season will start, and now it's time to prepare the fields. The Naiban and a boy from the village do the field work, while the Naiban's son burns vegetation. Here in the mountains, I can survive with very little money. Life here is different from life in a town. Whenever you look for food here, you can find some. The Naiban knows how difficult their situation would be if they moved to the lowlands. He sees the advantages of mountain life, for example, in the less frequent outbreaks of dangerous diseases due to the cooler mountain climate. Up here, my parents never had to go to hospital. If you live in the lowlands, if there is no hospital, you cannot survive. Of course, the Naiban's views are not undisputed in a time of change. And it may be hard for the younger generation to find ways of satisfying their lust for life in a remote mountain village. The Naiban is aware that the temptations of a modern lifestyle may lure some young people to leave the village. If somebody doesn't want to live here, they can go to school in the lowland or become government staff. Or they can get married to Tai Lu people in the lowland and live there. But their parents will stay here. The Aka have a long tradition of successfully adapting to a changing world and integrating new influences into their culture. If they are given enough time, and the opportunity to choose how they want to cope with the modern world, chances are good that the Aka culture will survive. In village schools, a new generation of Aka takes the first steps towards an education which they will need for the challenges that lie ahead. They will be the ones to decide which traditional knowledge and values are kept alive to shape Aka life in 21st century Laos. <laughs> <laughs>